Okay, so let's start. So this is the first lecture for our uh, course, uh, Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Technologies. So this course actually covers a lot of topics. As you can see, uh, we will first cover the cryptographic background that is required for this course. So it will be cryptographic hash functions and uh, digital signature algorithms. Then we will talk about cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrency mining, consensus models, soft and hard forks, smart contracts, uh, non-fungible tokens. And throughout the course, I will give a lot of misconceptions about blockchains and cryptocurrencies. Then we will talk about zero knowledge protocols that are used mainly in cryptocurrencies for anonymity. And finally, we will conclude our discussion with the security and attacks of blockchains. Okay, so let's start with the word crypto. Cryptographers are really angry about this. Okay, so crypto means cryptography, not cryptocurrency. But if you Google crypto, then you will see a lot of news about you know Bitcoin and Ethereum and so on. And again, this is a news from a recent event. So the stadium changes their name to crypto because their sponsor is related to some cryptocurrencies. So this is a, actually a big problem for us because 10 years ago, when you search Google as crypto, you will see the crypto conference that is held every year in Santa Barbara. But today it is very hard to find the correct or uh, true information about something on Google when you search like this. Okay, so let's start with the short history and see why we have cryptocurrencies or how we obtained a technology like a blockchain. So the short history is as follows. The internet and cryptography made electronic money possible. So internet allowed us to connect to many devices throughout the internet and cryptography with public key cryptography allowed us to communicate in a secure way. So this actually raised the question if we can make electronic money. So throughout the nineties, there were a lot of companies offering digital money and except PayPal, all of them got you know, bankrupt and closed their you know, companies. So we can have some desired properties for this uh, digital or electronic money. So we may prefer that uh, they have such properties like no need for a central authority, prevent double spending, uh, provide anonymity, allow offline payment, and maybe some other properties. So allowing offline payment is a hard thing. Think about cash, you know, you can just use the cash and uh, you don't need to connect to any service and you can use it in real life. But having a, a digital currency that can be used offline without having any uh, uh, connection to the network is a hard problem, but actually this is also solved. I think by some blind signatures by David Cash and uh, colleagues, but uh, Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency doesn't allow you that, but they all allow you the other properties. So uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, they don't need a central authority. They prevent double spending. Bitcoin or Ethereum kind of uh, cryptocurrencies provide pseudo anonymity, but there are some cryptocurrencies that allow full anonymity. And we will talk about them when we talk about uh, zero knowledge protocols, okay? But the important thing is that almost every e-cash company failed until the invention of Bitcoin in 2008, okay? So actually this is, uh, these requirements actually come from a, a community that's called cypherpunk because uh, those people think that since we have crypto and it is available for citizens, maybe we can use cryptography to have more anonymity because otherwise we give almost all of our uh, information to the companies or governments and we uh, actually have to trust them. But with the use of crypto, maybe we don't have to do that. This was the main idea behind the cypherpunk uh, movement, let's say. And Bitcoin might be considered as one of the latest uh, part of this community. So it was proposed by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008. So there's a white paper. I think everybody should go and read this. It is a very important one because it is nice to see what 
people thought in 2008, and now we are in 2022, I guess, because we stopped counting in due, due to pandemic, but uh, it is nice to see how things have transformed in the last 15 years, okay? So, of course, we don't know who Satoshi really is. He might be a woman, a man, or a group of people. We don't know. He didn't appear yet. At a, the main idea behind this movement was to have a decentralized ledger, let's say. So think about the bank. So all of the customer information, all of the transactions, all of the accounts balance are stored in a central authority. And we don't know who has money in that bank and so on, right? So it is centralized. Idea was to decentralize it. So take this information, take this database and share it with everybody like a you know peer-to-peer uh, -peer file transfer right like, like a torrent so the main idea is to just take the ledger which is, keeps all of the transactions all of the balances and share it with everybody but this makes everything public right all accounts and transactions are public in bitcoin so most people don't know this but you can go and see which account transferred what amount of money to which account and so on. So everything is transparent and public. But this makes uh, another thing. So if everything is public, then there is no encryption, right? Because you can see all of the data. So this is a surprise for a lot of people because the name is cryptocurrency. So people think that there should be an encryption involved, but actually there isn't. So if there isn't any encryption in Bitcoin, then why do we call it a cryptocurrency, right? So we use, other properties, for instance, if you decentralize the system and keep all of the account information on different computers throughout the network, then we have to be sure that all of them are the same, right? We have to be sure about the integrity of the system. So integrity of these ledgers are provided by cryptographic hash functions. So crypto comes into play as a hash function here. We, uh, you also have to solve the double spending problem because if you, keep all of the transaction info on different computers. So if you decentralize them, and maybe in one of them, you can spend money and in the other one, you spend and send that money to other people, right? So the, there might be a disagreement between the network. So a money can be spent twice because uh, since the whole info is on the network, so you can tell the people in the United States that you are sending your Bitcoin to person A, and before they are processing this, you can also go to the other side of the network and say that I'm also sending this Bitcoin to person B. So half of the network thinks that you send it to B and the half of the network will think that you send it to person A. So you actually spend the same money twice. So in order to solve this, we also use some hash puzzles. This is actually where crypto mining comes from. Again, we use cryptographic hash functions for this. So crypto comes into play as hash functions most of the time. But uh, other thing is that if you are sending somebody a cryptocurrency, so you actually prove that it belongs to you and you have to sign the transaction. So we need digital signatures here. So this is where crypto comes into play. We need cryptographic hash functions and we need digital signatures, please. Yes. No, in order to say an encryption, for instance, you need to have a plain text, you encrypt it and obtain a cipher text. So if you can decrypt it and obtain the plain text back, then this means that it is an encryption, right? In the digital signatures, you're actually signing a, a hash of a input. So you're just saying that I only I can sign this and this actually it says that I have the private key. Yeah. Uh, so yes, but that is not encryption or decryption. Okay. Yes. Or authentication depends on how you look at it. Okay. So uh, this approach actually provides pseudo anonymity because we cannot talk about full anonymity because we said that everything is transparent. We can look all of the transaction data. So there isn't anonymity, but we don't know 
which account belongs to who, right? In the system, all of our account numbers will be actually come from our uh, public keys, and you don't know which public key belongs to which person. For instance, but if you go to Twitter and you know, uh, send a tweet saying that this is my account, just send me money. This actually breaks this pseudo anonymity because you actually people can uh, uh, see who that account belongs to in real life. Okay, so actually. What uh, forensics people try to do in this case is to uh, destroy the pseudo anonymity because if uh, there is some illegal activity, for instance, some people uh, earn Bitcoin using ransomware. So if we detect it, a forensic people has to try to find who that account belongs to, belongs to in real life. So one of the topics of this course will be try to actually follow the money. So we will try to see how this, these transactions work in the blockchain. So that uh, if you work in the forensics area in the future, you should be able to understand how the money travels in cryptocurrencies. Okay. So we have to understand what the blockchain data looks like, and we will we should be able to actually uh, uh, decode what that those hexadecimal uh, values means. Okay. So one of the topics in this lecture will be to see how to analyze Ethereum or Bitcoin blockchain, okay? So that is being said, so this actually, uh, so maybe I haven't mentioned yet, but the blockchain technology is actually invented by Bitcoin. So by the Bitcoin idea, we realized that, okay, this topic uh, can be used in other places. So Bitcoin is actually the first blockchain that we have. And a blockchain actually looks like this. So you have transactions. These are saying that I'm sending this amount of Bitcoin to this person and so on. So these are all of your transactions. And uh, all of this transaction data is kept as your block data. And there's also the block header. So the whole thing is called a block, but it consists of two parts, the headers and the block data. So your transactions are your block data. And uh, you take the hash of these transactions then you pair them and take their hash again. And in the case of Bitcoin, we are going to use SHA-256. So you take the hashes again, you pair them again, take the hash again. So this is actually called the Merkle tree, okay? So you are, and this is your Merkle root. And in the header, you actually keep that info and move on to the next block. So every block header actually contains this Merkle root which actually kind of provides the integrity of all of these transactions. And the miners use a nonce value. In the case of Bitcoin, it is 32-bit value. So this nonce value is actually the nonce that is used by the miner. A very small value, 32-bit, which is like four bytes. You have a timestamp, which is actually tells you at which time this uh, block is created. And the previous hash actually comes from this previous uh, Merkle root from the previous block. So this way you are chaining your blocks and this is where the name blockchain comes from, okay? So this is the main idea. The, and this is how the picture looks like. So all of, of course, these transactions contains the digital signatures. So hashes are involved here and also in the mining and the Digital signatures are used here. Any questions so far? Okay, so let me show you the Genesis block. I hope you can see it. So this is the decoded version of the first block of the Bitcoin. So, okay, so since there isn't any previous block, uh, this is just a, a, and there isn't any, transactions in the first block, since you are creating the system yet, you actually involve here only one transaction and it is called Coinbase, as you can see here. So in every block, uh, the creator of that block is rewarded. And in the initially it was 50 Bitcoins. So with the start of this Genesis block, the first block is always called the Genesis block. 
it only contains the transaction where which account actually receives this reward. So this is generated by Satoshi just the first week of, I think in 2009. So throughout the 2008, the all of the implementation of this uh, Bitcoin is completed. And as the first week of the 2009, he actually provided this Genesis block. So this actually hexadecimal value contains the uh, account, but there's also hidden information hidden uh, embedded in this hexadecimal value. So let me show you it here. So if you use a software, I mean, you can of course write your own code, but I prefer this uh, free software to decode this hexadecimal values. So if you take that Coinbase, actually this is the whole uh, Genesis block, start of the Genesis block. And this part is the Coinbase transaction part. As you can see, there is a hidden message here. It says the times, 3rd of January, 2009, chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. So this is actually the uh, first page of the times dated 3rd of January in 2009. As you can see, it is this header. So actually there's two messages given here. At that time, actually there was a, a big problem in economy in the world and also in the United States. So this actually tells that they are going to use citizens taxes to you know, rescue some of the banks. So this is also one of the reasons why people are uh, generating their own cryptocurrency. So there, there's a distrust on banks. So it tells you this, but it also tells you that this block is generated exactly at this date because Satoshi could do it months ago. He could generate all of the blocks, like maybe first 10,000 blocks and claim that he did it that day. But now he cannot do it because he embedded the date on the uh, first block and he has to wait to receive the Times newspaper that day so that he can write it here. So this is actually telling you uh, that he is not cheating because some in the future or in the internet, you can see that some cryptocurrencies are called pyramid. So designers of this cryptocurrency mine the system before they are making the blockchain public. So this way they earn maybe uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of coins so that when the system starts, they can use that coins. So in this case, Satoshi is proving that he is not actually pyramid anything. So he is generating the first block here. And uh, so this, so there's also the, the rest of the part is actually the uh, account number that this uh, 50 Bitcoins are rewarded to. So these 50 Bitcoins are never used. So this first money rewarded in the Genesis block is not used, but actually it is not possible to use anyway because there is a quirk here. So probably it was done intentionally. So even if anybody wants to, even if Satoshi wants to use those 50 Bitcoins, actually he cannot. So there's a, but I believe that he did it intentionally. Okay. So let me give you a little bit more information about the specifications of the Bitcoin and we can uh, continue. So initially Bitcoin uh, designs so that each block can have at most one megabyte of data. So I show you this picture here, we have transactions. So these transactions cannot exceed one megabyte. So this is what actually limits you in a blockchain. And uh, since we are adding blocks to the end of each other, uh, so far we reach current, I think 390 gigabytes as of today, but it increases linearly. So this doesn't propose any problem for us. So it wouldn't exceed petabytes in the following years. But the important thing is that if you want to keep a copy of your blockchain, but we always encourage people to be a node and you know, keep a copy of the blockchain, you have to spend this amount of your hard drive. So this is why you cannot actually have the whole blockchain on your mobile phone, right? You wouldn't have that much amount of, but, but you, uh, you might think that, but we have wallet applications. So they are connected to the blockchain. If I'm not keeping the blockchain to myself, how can I 
transfer money. So you, these nodes are actually called light nodes. They actually connect to some service and they ask if uh, what is happening on the blockchain. Okay, so this is why when you install an app on your uh, computer or uh, your mobile phone, you are not actually downloading the whole blockchain. Block addition time is predetermined as 10 minutes. So when you try to perform a transaction, on average, it takes 10 minutes. So this is actually the hardness of the crypto mining hashing puzzle. And it is updated uh, depending on the speed of the network. Okay, so if more miners join the system, and if this number is reduced to like five minutes, in, the, in a few blocks later, the system will update itself. So the hashing puzzle will be harder. And this way, it will take again 10 minutes. So this is why we actually can see at which block we will be in the future. And initially, the total amount of Bitcoin is limited as 21 million. So this way, you know, the value is expected to increase in the future because there's a limited amount of Bitcoin and, you know, as the day, this is not happens in uh, normal currencies because there isn't any limit to money that you can produce as a country, right? So currently almost 19 million is in circulation. So only 2 million left to be mined. And uh, current mining reward is uh, 6.25 Bitcoins. Initially it was 50, but it is half in every four years. So, uh, I think uh, two years ago in May, or that was last year, it reduced, it, it was halved again. So probably in two or three years again, it will be halved. So this way, I think until 2140, we will be mining these Bitcoins. And at the end of the time, all of the 21 million Bitcoin will be mined. So there wouldn't be any more new Bitcoins added to the system after that time. But of course, mining will continue because you don't only get the mining reward, but you also get the fees that is gathered from the transactions. So in the future, you will get more fees than the mining reward. Okay. So these are predetermined before the system starts. So we might choose to change the specs, but if you change it, then actually people who change it uses a different blockchain and people who keep the old version uses a different blockchain. So this is causes a hard fork. So this actually duplicates the blockchain. It is like creating a parallel universe. So actually it means that you are actually uh, dividing a currency and generating two different cryptocurrencies. So in this kind of hard forks, for instance, if you create a Bitcoin hard fork now, if you have for instance, one Bitcoin, after this hard fork, you will have two different cryptocurrencies and you will have one coin in both of them because you're just duplicating the system. So this is why Bitcoin always try to avoid hard forks, but maybe in the future they may cause a hard fork. But if you make small changes that are backward compatible, then this is called soft fork and adding a cryptographic algorithm actually causes a soft fork. And uh, just a few months ago, in November 2021, Bitcoin had a, a soft fork. They added a new signature algorithm, Schnorr signatures. So this way they created a soft fork. And uh, I think it was like four years since Bitcoin received an update. So generally you don't update the system as regularly as uh, Ethereum, because there has to be a agreement in all of the uh, people. So we have to, we will talk about Schnorr signatures when we talk about digital signatures, okay? So there was also a soft fork in 2017. So it was the SegWit update. So that actually didn't change the block size, but it virtually updated to four megabyte. This is why, uh, I'm telling you this because if you go to blockchain and look at a, a recent block, you might see that it's, its size exceeds one megabyte, right? So this is because of this, because uh, the signature data covers the most of the part. 
So this with this update, not everything is stored there. So this way you can virtually have four megabyte of blocks in the Bitcoin system. So I think it is a good time to give a break.